we are joined once again by pre-court co-director Sally Benson, who will be moderating our Stanford educators panel. She is joined by three Stanford deans. We have Jonathan Levin, dean at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, Deborah Satz, dean of the School of Humanities and Sciences, and Jennifer Whittem, dean of the School of Engineering. So uh, Sally, over to you. Okay, well, terrific. Um, so to all of you in the Energy of Stanford and Slack program, I hope you've been enjoying it. Um, it seems by your uh, participation in the chat function, you're highly engaged, which is awesome. And uh, thanks to Alicia for, for that, uh, that great talk. Um, so we're really uh, lucky today to have three of the deans uh, from Stanford University joining us. And one of the most fantastic things I think about Stanford is that students, even though they're enrolled in a particular school <clears throat> and even a particular department, that they often take classes across the entire university. So it's particularly relevant to have the, uh, uh, these deans here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, two other deans that we invited, uh, Steve Graham from the School of Earth, uh, wasn't available, uh, as, um, as well as uh, uh, Dean Muller, uh, the Dean of Research. But uh, thank you, John, Deborah, and, and Jennifer for joining us. So just to let you know a little bit more about this class of, of uh, incoming graduate students, um, 33 are from the GSB. Uh, 67 are from engineering, 17 are from uh, H&S, and eight from Earth, and we even have someone from the medical school. So uh, very uh, diverse, uh, diverse cohort of students that we have this year. So, uh, so to kick things off, um, what I would like to do is ask the first question, and, and really for all of you, um, what kind of energy-related teaching and research is taking place in your school, just so we can broaden the knowledge base for the, for the uh, students here. And uh, maybe we'll, we'll start with, with John, if that's okay. Sure, thank you, Sally. And I really appreciate the chance to be here. It's and it's great to see so many GSB students who are interested in energy and, and sustainability uh, participating in this. Um, and welcome all of you to, to Stanford. It's, um, it's, it's great to ha have everyone uh, and get started with what's going to be uh, quite an extraordinary year. So uh, energy at the, at the GSB, it's actually hard to know where to begin because there's there's lots going on. And I, I think um, on the education side, some of you are probably, who are GSBers are probably thinking about the EIPER joint degree program. That has become one of the our most uh, popular uh, joint degree programs. The interest in, in both energy and climate sustainability has just been going uh, up and up. And on the faculty side and in classes, we are now offering a, we're offering a whole set of electives around around climate, and um, and a lot of faculty have gotten interested uh, in sustainability issues over the in recent years, and and that actually spans across all different types of uh, sort of perspectives on management. So we have we have faculty in operations who are really interested in issues like sustainable supply chains. We have uh, folks who are in our political economy group who are interested in government policy and regulation around energy, around climate, around sustainability. We have uh, faculty in our economics group who are, are interested from, a, uh, from an economic perspective. Um, we, have a, we just hired a finance professor about a year ago who is interested in basically long dated securities and securities that are perpetuities or have a last last for a long time. And when you have long dated securities, it turns out that that the effects of climate change matter for how they're priced. So he's gotten into thinking about climate, but from a completely different perspective. And then we one of the features at the GSB is that we often much of our teaching, particularly in the electives, is done by practitioners who we bring in uh, from outside, sometimes to teach with our tenure line faculty and sometimes to teach on their own. And we've increasingly been trying to bring people in who have an energy background or who have an interest in sustainability from a business perspective to, 
to offer classes that would uh, talk about business models that will support the energy transition or that have you know, explicit sustainability goals. So, you know, it's a big topic of discussion at the school, and I think you'll all experience that. And it's it's a really important discussion. And if you think about, you know, where are the what is what are the where is the potential to drive really important change in energy and in sustainability? I think we all understand that public policy, a carbon tax or something like that, would be the the natural global solution. But in the absence of something like that happening, it's going to have to come from the private sector and from business innovation and from different business models that are going to drive change. And I think that's something that, you know, we were talking about and thinking about all the time at the GSB. Okay, well, terrific. Thanks very much. Uh, how, how about uh, moving over to Deborah? Right. So uh, I, I want to echo uh, John's welcome. Uh, we're really glad and excited to uh, welcome you to Stanford. It will be a challenging year. Uh, and the way I'm thinking of the year, it's a year we all need to have a kind of double focus. Um, there's a lot going on in the world outside that is uh, stressful and uh, challenging and exhausting. And we need to focus on riding the waves and making sure we all get the support we need at the same time that we need to move forward with the very important uh, teaching and research missions of the university and to really focus in. And that's gonna be a challenge, uh, but we are committed, uh, I think as a school and a university, uh, to making sure that the you know, um, transformational, innovative, exciting, creative uh, work of our grad students and our faculty and our postdocs continues and um, we're thrilled that you're here. So let me say a little bit about the School of uh, Humanities and Sciences. We're a super broad school. Unlike uh, many of the other schools, we're not unified around a kind of broad topic area, but we span um, you know, people who work on dark matter and dark energy to people who work on medieval poetry. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's quite a, uh, an array. We have 23 different departments and 23 different uh, pro interdisciplinary programs. But uh, energy and sustainability and uh, managing the environmental crises we face are really interdisciplinary and are gonna call on expertise from many different types of people, from economists to uh, political scientists, to biologists and chemists, to historians. Uh, and you, it's really not, uh, I think of energy and, uh, and the environment in general, you know, as not the uh, primary possession of any one area of knowledge, but we'll really need all of us working on this because, um, there are a lot of reasons, some uh, purely technological, some political, some ethical, that have made finding solutions so difficult. Um, and so the school really, I can't say every department contributes <laughs> equally to the uh, study of energy or has it um, as central, but uh, it really, you know, it ranges from uh, obviously people in our chemistry department working on uh, catalysts and catalytic, uh, you know, agents that might, um, uh, you know, lower the cost of uh, certain and and make more efficient certain kinds of uh, processes, chemical processes. People are working on batteries, on creating sustainable plastics, um, on fundamental research, uh, not oriented to one particular area, but that we think will advance our understanding of molecules uh, and uh, how they come together and, uh, and ways we can intervene. Uh, uh, as Like John in the business school, we have a bunch of economists who are working on policy issues from 
uh, questions about optimal taxation to emissions trading policies to thinking about uh, the regulation of air quality is very much a factor right now, <laughs> as you know, in California. Uh, and we have historians who work on the conditions that have led governments to choose sustainable or unsustainable paths of agricultural development and what we can learn from them. And of course, we have biologists who study, um, uh, you know, various kinds of energy sources from biological uh, processes and biological materials. So it's, there's a tremendous amount to offer, uh, I think, from the school. Uh, we're all excited about the possibility of some new structure, a school of sustainability and some structure that helps uh, bring more of us together uh, because one of the things about, that Stanford is great at is creating phenomenal research, but kind of disparate. And, uh, and there's so much going on often, it's really hard to keep track of what there is. Uh, and we have an opportunity here to really uh, become much more than the sum of our parts. And so we're excited about that possibility. But Please, there's lots of stuff in the School of H&S uh, related to energy research um, and, and courses that deal with these issues. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, it's so incredibly broad, the School of H&S, and uh, yeah, and so much to contribute. So, uh, so maybe we'll move over to uh, Jennifer Widom, the Dean of the School of Engineering. Hi, everyone, I'm Jennifer. Um, get ready with your raise hand uh, button if you're joining the School of Engineering as a new graduate student, because I'm just going to do a little survey. Don't raise it yet. Oh, sorry. Just get ready. I'm going to uh, be just doing a survey because I'm going to guess that we probably have in this group people from all nine of our engineering departments. We'll see. But um, we, so there's 60 some of you, as I understand, uh, 60 something engineers uh, in this cohort. So when I look at what goes on across the School of Engineering, we do have nine departments and I'm going to enumerate them in a moment. There's really two areas, I would say, maybe three, that there's a tremendous amount of cross-cutting work and a tremendous number of faculty working in applications in those areas. And they probably won't surprise you. One of them is human health and a full one third of the faculty in the School of Engineering actually have joint projects with people in the medical school. And the other area that's just really prevalent and becoming more so uh, every year is the area of energy and uh, sustainability. And I think close to a third of our faculty are actually also working in some aspect of, of energy. And so I was just going to mention our departments and for each one that that what they're doing just very briefly, and also just take a survey. Um, how many of you are, are coming into material science? Raise your hand, do a raise hand and, and yeah. So not surprisingly, uh, quite, oh wow, lots of material science. So there's all kinds of things going on with batteries and materials, materials for batteries and for energy storage. What about uh, chemical, let's let those hands. What about chemical engineering? I'm sure we have some chemical engineers. Raise your hand if you're a chemical engineer. Um, chemical engineering. Just a couple. That's a, a little surprising to me because a, a lot going on in chemical engineering as well. Um, and in our material science and chemical engineers often work very closely together. Many partnerships um, there, similar areas. Um, and again, sort of like Deborah mentioned, many people working in catalysts and so forth. What about bioengineering? Anyone here from bioengineering? A raise hand. All right, so that's that's uh, next year. We got to get some bioengineers in here because they're also, you know, they're people starting to work on on biofuels, um, and I think there's quite a close uh, relationship with some of the work going on with plant biology as well. Um, what about civil and environmental engineering? I hope we've got a great, awesome. There, you know, we have our civil and environmental engineering departments are combined. 
Um, on the civil side, there's a great interest now in sustainable urban systems. So just thinking about the, well, the world was getting urbanized and it still is as a world, though some small pockets, I think in the US are, are unurbanizing a bit, but just looking at energy use and sustainability in urban areas is a, is a huge area of our civil engineers. And of course, our environmental engineers are interested broadly in, in energy distribution and, and more broadly in environmental areas. What about mechanical engineering? Anybody from mechanical engineering? Great, oh, quite a few. And I'll just pause while you unraise and ask about electrical engineering. I hope we have some electrical engineers there as well. We do. So in across ME and EE, of course, people are also working on batteries and just, I like to think of the people in those departments as working on energy efficient everything. Um, so good group there. All right, I am very hopeful that we've got some people from management science and engineering. Anybody from manage, management science and engineering? There we've got a lot of work now on energy policy, on optimization. Our, our, our management science and engineering department really does go broadly from um, policy areas all the way over to hardcore operations research and all of those relevant to energy. Um, Computer scientists, we all know software is super important in all kinds of aspects of energy. How many computer scientists do we have here? Just one. So that's an area for growth next year as well. And then the last one I'm gonna ask about is aeronautics and astronautics. Do we have anybody from Aero Astro? Because there's good, uh, that's great. Because there's some really interesting work now going on in energy efficient spacecraft and even like fleets of microsatellites that is, I, I think is, is truly fascinating. So sorry to do the inventory there, but we are a school that's small enough that we can do an inventory of our departments. And again, with the theme being, we've got people across all nine of our departments working in the energy area. And of course, they're also working together, uh, collaborating with each other. I'm sure you've heard over and over how collaborative Stanford is, and, and we really are. That's very low barriers to collaboration and we have it within the school and across the um, entire university. So welcome to Stanford Engineering. Well, terrific. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, that's a great overview. So, so moving on to the next topic, that addressing challenges in global energy access and climate solutions requires an interdisciplinary per approach and systems thinking. So the question is, is for you, how do you think about this and what opportunities are provided in your school for developing these perspectives and skills? And uh, maybe we'll, uh, we'll go in reverse order. Maybe Jennifer will, will start with you. <laughs> well, I guess I just pick up where I left off, um, which is that, um, you know, it, this is absolutely a global challenge um, and a challenge that touches every part of the university. And so interdisciplinary is key. We've been moving in the School of Engineering towards what we call catalyst grants, where we have groups of faculty across many broad areas coming together and we seed those groups with fairly significant um, funding to get started on projects that will be very hard to start at that scale. And we have also partnered with the Precord Institute in doing this type of thing as well. And um, it will, I think we'll see more and more of that. There's more of an appetite. So I do think one of the, one of the issues with a, a global challenge of this scale is that sometimes in the university setting, it is hard to launch a group that's of the scale that you need to really get going and prove that you're gonna make progress. Um, it can't just be a bunch of small individuals with their small or medium sized grants. And so a lot of, on the research side, we're very interested in assembling those groups and working across the university to do that. Okay, terrific. Okay, thank you, uh, Deborah. Uh, so I'm just gonna, I think, basically echo what uh, Jennifer just said. Uh, uh, the barriers to interdisciplinary uh, collaboration here are as low as I've ever seen. Uh, the problems around energy and sustainability are not problems whose solution can rest with any one discipline. As I said, it's not just the technical set of questions we face, but a, a 
bunch of policy questions. There's some ethical aspects to what's fair. There are, you know, many dimensions to the uh, challenges we face around energy and climate. Uh, a couple of the initiatives coming out of the long range planning of the university, I think, have a, also an opportunity to contribute. So I think of, again, the uh, sustainability school is a, still a work uh, in construction, you know, in, in theoretical construction, but it will be a way to knit these different groups and faculty across all of Stanford's seven schools together in an exciting way. Uh, one thing in that's uh, a, a university um, uh, a priority that's housed in the School of Humanities and Sciences is the Stanford Impact Labs that seeks to bring social scientists together with data scientists together potentially with scientists, with the natural scientists uh, in partnership with NGOs, communities, state governments, city governments around knotty uh, problems. Uh, and climate is definitely one of the problems that uh, that group, you know, it'll be open to grants um, of teams applying. And so far we've had teams from all over the university being chosen. And there's a lot of interest in the space of environmental problems. So I think some of where the university is going around um, uh, catalyzing, to go back to catalyst, uh, research and figuring out ways to increase the um, power of the research we do and bring it to the public really fit with the, you know, the interdisciplinary nature of a lot of uh, the social problems we're grappling with today. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, so John, how about how about you? Well, I would second everything that that Deborah and Jennifer just said about interdisciplinary uh, research, and and also just add that you know when you when we think about a problem like energy transition uh, leading to to lower a lower carbon world. You know, I think we all understand that there's there's technical aspects to that problem. There's going to need to be a lot of technological breakthroughs in areas like batteries and clean energy. It, otherwise, just it can't happen. It, it, it's a, it's a political problem because the, the almost surely has to be some spur from regulation. It's a business problem, and it's a leadership problem. It's so all of those things have to come together if we're going to have a, a, a dramatic change in, in energy and climate over the, the 21st century. And Stanford has all of those things. They're all, they're all here on campus, expertise in, in, in every one of those things. And I think one of the challenges for, for students is, is just finding them. And, and Jennifer uh, and Deborah alluded to this, is just how do, you, how do you connect with all of that expertise across the campus? And how do you connect with students who are in all of those, those areas? And I think you know one of the things that's great about an event like this is it's just a way to start to see where different things are located and who the different students are and and so forth and I would just encourage you to to try to seek out some of those those things as you go through the the program yesterday i was we ran a, a summer entrepreneurship program for uh, our MBA students who were between uh, year one and year two over the summer and yesterday I was at the final presentations. And one of the things that really struck me in seeing the student presentations was how many of the GSB students who had 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 an idea and were pushing it forward over the summer had had found someone or a group of people to work with from other Stanford schools. It was, and whether it was from the engineering school or the medical school or you know, different different places around campus, that was really really striking how many partnerships had, had formed in that way around really interesting uh, types of ideas, whether it was around energy or healthcare or, or whatever it was. I think, you know, that's, and that's going to be a little harder this year, frankly, because we won't have the chance for serendipitous meetings on campus. So it's going to take a little more proactive effort to get out there on, you know, to figure out ways to, to have those connections. But that is an amazing opportunity about being at Stanford 
you know, with, with all of these different lenses that you can tackle, come at a problem from. So I, I, you know, encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity in every way that you can. Yeah. So, so John, just to follow up, is that the Ignite program that you're talking about? Oh, well, I can mention that. Actually, this was, a di- this was a different program that we just uh, set up for, for this, that we just set up as an experiment during COVID, which was the Bosa Chan Innovation Internship Program, which was a program for GSB students to get funded to build that entrepreneurial pipe for the summer. But we do, for students outside the GSB, we run a program called Ignite, which we ran virtually this summer and will run again during the year. And it's a it's a wonderful program. This is a program where you can, you basically get a, a it's, it's an introduction to management and entrepreneurship and it's targeted at students in other schools around the GSB. And you can either do it part-time during the year, or you can do it over a month in the summer. And I encourage, you know, invite everyone who's outside the GSB to apply, particularly if you've got an interest in, you've got an entrepreneurial vendor, even if you don't, but you're just sort of intrigued to think about how work you're doing might eventually be commercialized or how you could be, you know, um, have that capability in your in your back pocket. Yeah, I, I know that's a, fa- a fantastic program. I've had a number of my students take it, so I highly encourage all of you to look into that. Um, so, so just a little bit more. I, I think the the theme you got, you know, regarding this question about addressing, you know, having getting an interdisciplinary perspective, is the Precord Institute has a number of initiatives. There's the Bits and Watts Initiative, which is about grid modernization. And it integrates all the way from fundamental innovation of a, a better a better gadget, all the way through to business models and so forth. And, and there's uh, one on natural gas, the natural gas initiative. There's the Storage X initiative, which we just launched uh, about six months ago. And uh, we also have a new carbon dioxide removal initiative that's coming along. So I highly encourage you to find a way to get engaged with those uh, as a way of developing this sort of systems thinking. We also have a fantastic class called the Energy Ventures class that is taught by two entrepreneurs. um, And uh, it's uh, Joel Moxley and Dave Danielson. And typically about a third of the students are from the business school, uh, a quarter maybe from the law school, and then the other half from engineering and humanities and science and so forth. So so seek out those opportunities because I think it's really by experience um, that you'll learn those things. Um, I was going to ask you all about the new school of sustainability, but you've all sort of touched on that. So I'd like to jump to really the next uh, the next question, which is, you know, what advice do you have for incoming graduate students as they begin their studies? And and given the these COVID nineteen days, perhaps you could sort of address something really specific. Do you have any suggestions? because we've all been living with this now for about six months. And, and I think we, we all have our, our favorite solutions, but uh, why, don't do, why don't we start with, with Deborah? Um, you know, <laughs> an easy question. Uh, you know, graduate school is a amazing, wonderful uh, opportunity of a kind that's just a gift uh, to have these years to pursue uh, your interests wherever they lead you and uh, to have the chance to uh, find out for yourself what matters to you and to push it um, in these new directions we're counting on you. Uh, so it's, it's an incredible opportunity. It's also, even in the best of times, uh, can be uh, challenging. Uh, can be isolating, can sometimes feel lonely. And I think all of that is heightened at this moment um, in the COVID world. I mean, I, <laughs> I have spent a lot of the last five months on Zoom and I will say you cannot Zoom the things that really matter. <laughs> uh, you know, the energy, uh, what John referred to as those serendipitous uh, conversations and meetings that you have with people. Uh, There's no substitute for those in-person collisions. Uh, So we're in a second, we're not maybe second, maybe third best world, but I would urge you to find ways to, in this time, be connected 
reach out, take advantage of resources, um, take advantage of the people, go you know, to Zoom meetings or classes and really try to create community, um, find out. You know, so one thing that we have gotten better on the internet, uh, you know, you, it's easier to survey all the different options that are going on and take care of yourselves because this is just a really challenging time for all of us and it's exhausting and it's really, really important. Like it's the backdrop to your, everything you do in the world of knowledge and education that you are, uh, you know, you're in a reasonably good health and good spirits and maintain a kind of hope um, in, a, in a very challenging time. So we have a lot of resources on the campus. There are university resources to help graduate students. Um, I or somebody else could send those around. Um, you can also go to the VPGE, the Vice Provost for Graduate Education web uh, site. Uh, a lot of the departments, and I hope all of them, are stepping up and really trying to create community uh, gatherings uh, where people exchange not just ideas um, and research, but also remind themselves why it's valuable uh, for us to be together. The, uh, I think, uh, um, I, I remember talking about this sort of at the uh, beginning of the crisis and, and John, I remember you're saying, and I completely agree with this, that the crisis has focuses, focused us so much on what really matters and what makes Stanford great is the people who are here and what they're able to do together um, by being here together. And we just have to find as best we can in this hard time ways to keep doing that. Um, and know that you know we'll get through this, and uh, we will have those serendipitous uh, meetings and uh, and conversations that blow you away and change the direction of your thinking. That will happen again, and some of that can happen on Zoom. It's just not uh, ideal. You know, one thing I would say is I I think in a way, even you know, despite all the challenges that that COVID has brought. Um, this is, a, this is an amazing time to be in school. The world is just going through an incredible period of change and on many different dimensions. And we're having this incredible acceleration of comfort with technology and, and, and this reckoning with societal issues, racism, and, but also things like thinking about other types of inequities in society around health and education and the, and the effects of, of climate change. And you know, the, world, the world is not going back to January 2020. It's going to be different when we get through this experience, and hopefully it's going to be better. And, and I, you know, the, our challenge is to sort of figure out how, how will we make it better when we come out of COVID? Uh, and and not, not necessarily how will, we, how will we get back to what we had before. And so, you know, in a way, at a time like that, it's just a great time to be able to to be able to invest in yourselves and to think and to reflect and to sort of figure out, you know, what is the path that you want to chart for yourselves when when we get through this. It's a great time to to launch your your career, whether it's going to be a career in research or in business or in policy or whatever direction you end up you end up going. And this group's going to go in all different different directions. So. I mean, that way, I, I'm, I'd be, I'm very optimistic about the experience you're going to have. And I think Deborah's point is just spot on in terms of, you know, the, the work that is going to have to go in this year to, to making sure that we realize the, what is so great about Stanford, which is the people, and, and making sure that, that you get the opportunities to meet people and to form relationships that are going to last and to learn from everyone on the campus, even though some of that learning is going to have to be in this remote technology mediated environment um, but hopefully we'll we'll get through that too and and uh, be able to get back to to doing what the, the things that we love in person so I I'm excited for all of you I think I think you're actually at a, at a great time in many ways this is like the perfect time to be starting graduate school e e much as that might be counterintuitive so 
uh, you know, I, I just, I, I think putting in the effort to try to make sure you meet people and form relationships. And like Deborah said, you know, just understanding that when things do go wrong this year and there are big challenges, you will not be the only person who is feeling that way on campus. There's going to be a lot of people who, who are with you in spirit and, and there to help you. Okay, thank you. That's uh, those inspiring words. How do we make it better when we come out of this? Uh, so, so Jennifer, uh, over, over to you. Yeah, as always, going third is difficult because I am you know, want to say similar things to what Deborah and John said, but uh, actually they kind of got me thinking. One way you could go into this year is saying, wow, this is the moment in my life where I've, you know, I'm coming to Stanford and it's entirely ruined because of this you know, virus and everything else going on and how could my first year of graduate school be ruined? Or you can look at it as wow, this is a time when I'm going to be able to make a difference in how we come out of this. And of course, you, it's much better to take that second viewpoint. Um, at graduate school, I always tell people, I think graduate school can be some of the best time of your life. Um, you're sort of through some of the anxieties of undergraduate. You probably know more or less what you want to do with your career. You're getting to specialize. Uh, you're getting to contribute. You're part of a cohort. Um, and so I, I just think it's a really exciting time. So if, if any of you are thinking about being a professor, enjoy graduate school, because once you're a professor, boy, you've got a lot more responsibility. <laughs> so, uh, but it's, I mean, being a professor is awesome as well. But uh, anyway, graduate school is a great time. Um, on, you know, on, on the personal side, if, uh, my recommendation, if you are living on campus is to get outside. You can see I'm outside. This is not a fake backdrop. This is my own backyard. I live near the foot of the dish trail for those of you who have become familiar. So get outside, walk the dish, uh, walk around. We're very fortunate that we're in California and have good weather once this smoke goes away. Um, but you know, I'm thinking this is gonna be a year where people are gonna be outside a lot for the year or try to get outside and we're gonna be able to do that because of our, simply because of our weather. Um, and I've been taking walks every evening and fairly often walk through the graduate student dorms, um, including the, the brand new ones. And I see a community building there. Uh, so, you know, put on your mask and go outside and meet other graduate students if you are living on campus. That's what I would do. And you'll meet some really interesting people. So I do think that even though we have a lot of restrictions, there are, you're in, if you are here, um, you're in a, a setting where you can still meet people. If you're not local, I hope you're in a okay situation and you try, you know, we're gonna have all kinds of opportunities for you to connect virtually. So a, again, you know, take advantage of everything Stanford has to offer even in this unusual time. Okay, well, thank you for that good advice. You know, I'm going to put you all on the spot. Um, this whole conversation has made me realize that uh, it's a little bit more difficult to get to know people uh, during these times, and we have to take every opportunity to try to do that. And of course, the three of you have very important leadership uh, positions at the university, but you're also incredible uh, academic scholars. And, and I just wanted to ask each of you to spend, you know, maybe two, three minutes just describing you, the kind of research that, that, that you do, the kind of questions that you're passionate about that have you know, driven you to, to get to the point where you are. And, um, and we'll start with you, Jennifer. And apologies for springing this on you, but I, it's such a great chance for people to get to know you all. Yeah, so no, I'd be happy to, uh, happy to, to talk about that briefly. I'll start by saying that I was a music major undergraduate, so I, I'm the only dean of engineering anywhere with a bachelor's degree in trumpet performance. I'm pretty sure about that. Um, but uh, and that takes a lot of energy. But anyway, I did switch over to computer science, so I am a computer scientist. And my research area when I began my career was considered one of the most boring areas of computer science, database management. Um, all we did then was build systems that handled large amounts of data and how boring could that be? Um, and at the time, the, you know, the, the people who were interested in using large amounts of data were people like banks and enterprises. And boy, has that changed in my career. So it's been really exciting for me to watch uh, my own research go from this sort of, uh, sort of traditional 
area of, and again, I was more on the systems building, so building systems for non-traditional types of data into something that is so important across every area. It's just, it's been wonderful to watch that the, the need for data, data systems, data analysis tools, data visualization tools, which is my area to uh, all of those areas to uh, blossom. So that's, that's where I've come from. And obviously data is huge to uh, making advances in energy, all, all aspects really. Okay, thank you. So, so Deborah, how about you? Okay, uh, so uh, maybe I'm you know, the furthest out here, I'm a philosopher. Uh, I'm a political philosopher. Lots of people don't really understand even what philosophers do, but actually philosophers are, uh, you know, we're all nascent philosophers. Uh, and what philosoph political philosophy does is it uh, responds to current problems and crises and confusions in the culture, uh, con things that are in contention that we're not sure of, and it tries to clarify what the values and concepts are, how they're related to each other, why they matter, as a way of um, trying to resolve and see whether there's a resolution for some conflicts that people um, are trying to deal with, conflicts between very abstract concepts like equality and liberty. You often hear that they can't be reconciled. This is, you know, large literature trying to explore the space for reconciliation. My own work has really been focused on um, issues about equality. Uh, I wrote, uh, I think, my first book, uh, which really looked at um, the reasons for thinking that uh, equality as a generic or abstract or simply income-focused um, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, project was too narrow and that there were real differences uh, between uh, when and where equality matters. So that equality, for example, in life expectancy or in um, access to opportunities is quite different uh, than the fact that we're all unequal in height. And so, uh, and people respond quite differently to different kinds of equality. And I tried to come up with a kind of an analysis of why that might be so and what values might be driving that. Uh, right now, I'm involved in a, a five-year project that's being led by uh, Angus Deaton, who's a economist at Princeton, uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, uh, which is working on something called the Deaton Report on Inequality in the 21st Century, and uh, mostly economists but I'm writing the normative chapter about where equality matters and why, and what are the different arguments, and how do you respond to people who think equality doesn't matter at all, what really matters is poverty, um, what are the kinds of arguments uh, that you can give, and how does this relate to some of the uh, directions that economic research should go in. And this is connected to climate, although I myself don't work on issues about climate, but clearly there are lots of considerations in the policy space, especially when we think globally about fairness um, in the distribution of, uh, of costs and benefits uh, in the context of climate change. Yeah, so, so Deborah, just a, a quick reminder that we actually did a project together. I work on carbon capture and storage, and there was an ethical issue. Um, you know, there are many ethical issues. You know, should we be doing pursuing carbon capture and storage? And you had two fantastic uh, postdocs who we we worked together, and that was a real treat. So thank you for that. Um, so now we'll, uh, John. Uh, what about you? What uh, what excites you? What is what was your academic path? So my background is as an economist, and uh, in fact, I started at Stanford in the economics department and was there for 16 years before I moved to the business school. And uh, in, within economics, I worked, I worked on, a, well, I worked on a bunch of different things, but I, I, most of my research was in a field called industrial organization, which is about research and innovation, R&D, competition, uh, regulation of, of different industries. 
and I particularly focused on technology industries. And so actually my field has now become, since I have less time for research, it's actually become incredibly interesting because people are rethinking with the rise of the large technology firms, the people are really rethinking the way government should regulate technology and the, the, the relationship between large business and, and government. And, and you can see the political divisions there. So there's a political aspect to it as well as a, an economic aspect to it. I, I sometimes wish I had more time to, to be thinking and writing about that because I think it is such an interesting problem, particularly since we're here in Silicon Valley. It's a really pertinent problem for, for us here. I also worked on other, one of the other areas I worked on was, was a field called market design, which is basically how to set up market mechanisms to accomplish different types of goals. So designing auctions or matching markets or different kinds of incentive mechanisms. And in fact, the, the last, the paper, I had an opportunity this last year to, to write a paper, which proved to, to be timely, which is that I wrote a paper over Christmas about creating incentives for vaccine development it's done some work that I had done probably 13 or 14 years ago to set up a program to accelerate the introduction of uh, pneumococcal vaccine in, in the developing world. It's a project I did with an economist at, at Harvard named Michael Kramer. And we wrote a paper at, over Christmas about uh, a retrospective on how that program, how we'd set it up and, and how it had worked. And, um, and then, of course, it, I mean, not anticipating that vaccines would be on everyone's mind uh, come, uh, come March. And so that, that proved to, to be uh, uh, the model we had set up called an advanced market commitment proved to be something that people have been thinking about a lot about now in the context of COVID. Um, so Michael's been doing a lot of uh, advising of different, different groups, including the WHO and, and the European Union and the White House and so forth. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's nice to feel by one, one degree of separation that uh, research is, is still relevant in the world. Yeah, well, anyway, those are really exciting stories. And for all of you, uh, in, you know, incoming graduate students, I, I hope you heard this common theme that people uh, pursue their academic interest and, and, you know, over time, the impact of these areas grow and all of a sudden you find yourself at the epicenter of, of, a, of a whole new wave of innovation. So, uh, so it's a, one way to think about it is, is you want to be in a situation where you're skating to the puck. And, and uh, so what are those areas, those really innovative new areas that, uh, that eventually will flourish and make a tremendous difference? Um, so now we want to open it up to questions. We don't have too long, but um, so what the way we'll do this is just please raise your hand and um, and we will call on you. Uh, great, thank you very much. Well, firstly, thank you to all the deal the deans and uh, Sally as well as an ex dean, I guess, um, uh, for the warm warm welcome to Stanford. Uh, my question was just really around the EI per program. Uh, you mentioned that it's particularly uh, popular these days and clearly very relevant for the audience uh, at the moment. Um, do you have any plans uh, to open that up to other graduate programs? For instance, the MSX program at the GSB? I can, I can take that one because it relates to a, a, a GSB uh, cross degree program. So the EIPR program is, is uh, students are able to enroll in that from a number of other programs uh, at Stanford, including our, our MBA program in the law school and, and so forth. There, I think with the plans in coming, there's now plans coming along to create a school of sustainability at Stanford that likely would be the home of the EIPR program. And I think there has been some discussion, at least in some of the things I've been in, about what would be the evolu natural evolution of that program? Could it expand? It's been very successful. Would there be more opportunities as, as Stanford has a bigger footprint in sustainability? So I think that's, you know, there will be some discussion over the coming year about what, you know, can, can that program be expanded? It's been a wonderful and successful program uh, already. And so it's, and there's probably more opportunities. I don't know that there's, I'm not aware of any specific plan at the moment to expand it, but I, but it's certainly in the air as, as, a, as something that people will want to think about with the new school. It'd, it'd be fantastic if we could, clearly, but uh, that's very exciting that there's a new school of sustainability as well. Um, it's a fantastic development. I think I'll answer the question. You know, we're in the middle of Silicon Valley. 
so, so not only is the campus itself, a, you know, incredible opportunity to be there, but uh, you know, how can students take advantage of the place that they're in? Now, I know it's a little bit hard night right now with COVID-19, but, you know, if we roll that back and we, we imagine that, uh, you know, this is past, uh, how, how can that enrich the, the graduate student experience? And that I'll open up that to all of you and whoever wants to go first, just go first. Yeah, I'll I just there. jump in and say, you know, even in COVID times, we have very close connections with Silicon Valley, with companies. A lot of companies, uh, some of them sponsor our research. A lot of them are have our graduates uh, working there or leading the companies. Um, the people at companies are very interested in giving seminars and meeting students, uh, hiring them for internships. So there is a very close collaboration and in some ways, some of our seminars and people's interest in speaking at them and the participation in them has increased quite a bit. So one, you know, one positive effect of COVID is everybody's at home, they're not traveling. Um, and so we've seen increased participation. So there's gonna be a lot of events that cross your email, a lot of them. And I just say, pay attention to those events, pick ones that interest you, go to them sometimes, you know, if there's questions or opportunities to meet speakers. Just take advantage of everything that, that we offer because even in this current mode, there's there are gonna be a lot of opportunities, I would say, to make connections here from meet people in uh, in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just highlight one of the programs that Precord Institute offers. It's um, uh, the Tomcat Center. Um, organizes the opportunity to work in uh, energy startups in Silicon Valley and their summertime appointments and uh, they're really really interesting you are you know typically in a very tiny company that's in this very early stage of, of trying to get off the ground and they're very exciting because you kind of do everything you're you know incredibly important part of the team so I, I encourage you to take a look at that we also have a, a fantastic uh, internship. Uh, it's now going to be called the Schultz Energy Fellows Program, where we place people with uh, local government. So we place people in Palo Alto, uh, Sacramento, San Francisco, and you work directly with the leaders of the, these uh, government organizations and really understand what, uh, what public service uh, is like in terms of a, of a career. So do we have any more more questions? Oh, I, is it okay if I ask a question? Of course. Um, this is uh, really, I think, for Dean Sachs, but anyone's welcome to, um, to opine. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on sort of where we are with our current political moment and partisanship and kind of how that all relates to, to climate and energy as a political philosopher. <laughs> Uh, ask me after um, in November. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> Fair uh, enough. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I think it's a challenging moment, um, and uh, I will say that uh, one of the things H and S is doing that I'm very excited about, and you should all. Um, it's I think now posted on the H and S web page, and we'll be pushing it out to the community. Uh, under uh, the leadership of our new senior associate dean in the uh, social sciences, Ron Abramitsky, we're running a um, fall uh, weekly uh, series on problems in democracy yep. that'll look at everything from healthcare to climate uh, to racial injustice to inequality, and it will showcase faculty in the university, I think we have 39 faculty lined up from the law school, the business school, the engineering school, H&S. It's really fantastic. And uh, part of what we're trying to do is, you know, again, evidence-based uh, analysis, trying to also understand why in the light of evidence, sometimes people disagree, to what extent those disagreements are about uncertainty about the evidence, to what extent it's about different values and the, uh, ranking different values differently so people will make different trade-offs, to what extent it's in, involved in uncertainty. So it'll be offered as a one unit course for undergrads, but it will be open to everybody with a Stanford ID. 
And um, I think this would be you know, a great moment to sample lots of phenomenal research that's going on in the university around everything from voting to political polarization to racial justice. Um, and, uh, and hopefully spark a lot of really good conversations. Okay, we'll take one last question. This will be from Hisu, and uh, then we'll wrap up. So Hisu, why don't you ask your question? Uh, um, yeah, so I'm a I'm an incoming uh, physics PhD student, so the humanity science. But I have a lot of interest in like political theory, like uh, and like history and those kind of kind of, like things that are very much unrelated to what I will be researching, which is the material science. Um, and then, so what are some of the ways that like uh, students who are doing research in a very unrelated field kind of get involved with like what's happening in the other kind of uh, side and also like learn more about the more active research in that area? Um, so there's some great classes offered in the philosophy and political science department around, um, uh, you know, everything from why democracies succeed and fail to what are the ethical values at stake in democracy versus hierarchy. Uh, uh, how do we think about, uh, you know, uh, achieve, you know, uh, debates about justice? So I would look at, and there are a lot of grad offerings as well as the kind of mixed undergrad grad courses we do. There's also a lot coming out of, again, some of the um, uh, long range planning. So uh, there is an ethics and technology and science initiative. Uh, there's something we're calling a hub that brings together people from the medical school and people from the sciences, from computer science, uh, from political philosophy, who are interested in ethical and political questions. Uh, the co-leaders of that initiative are Margaret Levy, who's a political scientist and runs our Center for Behavioral, uh, for the uh, Advanced Study of the Behavioral Sciences up on the hill and uh, Rob Reach, who is a political philosopher. And they're doing some really wonderful things. And the aim of this is actually, he sort of bridge the gap between our incredible work that goes on in the campus in technology and science with some incredible work going on in ethics and political philosophy and to find ways of bringing that into dialogue. Um, there's a, a, an undergraduate course uh, taught, uh, co-taught, uh, probably uh, a, a very uh, popular, successful course on uh, ethics, politics, and uh, computer science uh, that try, is taught, co-taught by an ethicist, a policy person, and a computer scientist trying to help students move back and forth and understand both all of those different languages. Um, and be able to think, you know, we shouldn't get into thinking, I'm a technologist, so I don't need to think about these other questions of ethics. Uh, there are lots of points of uh, ethical decision making that is involved in the conduct of scientific research. And wherever you come down on those issues, you want to be, you know, able to be reflective on it and have the opportunity uh, to get feedback. So it sounds like there are lots of opportunities. Anyway, thank you to, to uh, the three of you for joining us. This was an incredibly great and exciting panel. Uh, so, and thank you for sharing your own personal, uh, personal stories as well. And with this, I think we will wrap up this session and uh, thank you so much.